Sam Kale, and today I'm looking at The Doors by The Doors. The Doors is The Doors, a uh, debut self-titled album released January 4th, 1967. It was preceded by Nothing and followed um, by Strange Days. I guess before anything else, I should talk about the band history and the origin of the band itself. The Doors consist of Jim Morrison on vocals, Ray Manzarek on keyboards, piano, and organ, Robbie Krieger on guitar, and John Densmore on drums. Now the band history started in early 1965 when Jim Morrison met Ray Manzarek in Venice Beach. Ray Manzarek was in a surf rock band with his two brothers called Rick and the Ravens from 1961 until 1965. Jim Morrison sort of became an informal member of Rick and the Ravens until it dissolved like a few months later. But now Jim and Ray had this idea of starting a new band kicking around in their heads, so they recruited some of Ray's old friends, Robbie Krieger and John Densmore, who were in a psychedelic folk band called the Psychedelic Rangers, and actually had to get, I mean, Robbie Krieger to start playing electric guitar because he had never picked up an electric guitar in his life. He had only played flamenco and acoustic guitar because he was, prim he was primarily playing folk music. They had sort of played around at different clubs. Now it's the doors all around uh, Southern California. They started becoming regulars at the Whiskey A Go-Go, which was a club in uh, West Hollywood, and they eventually became the house band. Columbia Records hired, um, signed them in early 1966 in hopes of creating an album, but they never got it done and then they dropped them. And around May or June of 1966, Elektra Records offered them contract if they were to record an album that year. <laughs> and so they did, and now there is this. But I might as well say the personnel again. Jim Morrison on vocals, Ray Manzarek on keyboard, bass keyboard, organ, and electric piano, Robbie Krieger on guitar and bass guitar, and John Densmore on drums and backing vocals, and for non-band member personnel, Larry Netchel on bass guitar on most of the tracks, Paul Rothschild uh, produced the album, and Bruce Botnick was the chief engineer of the audio engineer of the album, who we saw last week in Let It Bleed. Now bass, guitar, and just bass lines in general on Doors albums are often very confusing because there's no dedicated bassist to the Doors. So a lot of the times it's a session musician, sometimes it's Robbie Krieger, sometimes it's um, Ray Manzarek playing a bass keyboard. And in live performances, what he would do to do bass lines is he would play the um, organ or piano with his right hand and then he'd play that bass line with his left hand. Anyway, let's get into the recording, I guess. Recording for the album started sometime in early August 1966. There's not a dead, there's not a recorded date of when it started and ending, ended recording. It was just sort of August of 1966. And then it was mixed in September of 1966. There's not a whole lot known about the recording of the album, really. It was all recorded very quickly, within the span of like two weeks. And it was initially, initially it was supposed to have a much earlier release date than it was released. It was supposed to be released sometime in October or November of 1966, but they figured that early January would be a good time to release an album because the sales would be higher, which I don't know why they were thinking that, because that's when the holiday season ends. And it seems like that less people would be like shopping and stuff. I don't I don't know what their logic was. I, I don't know. It maybe album sales in January were just like a thing in the sixties. The recording of the album was sort of plagued by Jim Morrison's behavior. While on LSD trips, he just kinda smashed the studio up, which is not desired. But during the recording of the end, uh he had a breakdown and threw a TV across the room and it broke and then he just stormed out in a fit of rage. But yeah, that's really all I got for you for the recording. Let's get into the track by track breakdown. <laughs> track number one is Break On Through to the Other Side, which was the initial single release for the album, released New Year's Day 1967, but it failed the chart really. John Densmore utilizes the bossa nova craze that came from Brazil in the intro to this song, where he plays like a bossa nova Brazilian like jazz groove. And this is one of the songs where the bass line is um, a bass keyboard uh, played by Manzarek. The intro bass line is played on the bass keyboard. 
And apparently the main guitar riff for the song was ripped off from Elmore James by Robbie Krieger. It's one of the Doors' more famous songs, and it was played in almost every single live show they did. That is every live show that wasn't just Jim Morrison drunkenly rambling into the microphone for an hour and a half. Track number two is Soul Kitchen. Soul Kitchen was one of the first Doors songs written, written in early 1965 by Jim Morrison about just a really good diner in Venice Beach. This whole song, with all of the like poetic and like symbolism that you think is hidden in it, it's really just about a real some really good really good pancakes well not pancakes exactly but it's about soul food i mean jim morrison can make anything sound poetic he wrote a three and a, a three and a half minute song about his favorite diner and it sounds like a william blake poem i start writing music i'm gonna make a song about a diner however with all my praise about the the lyrical meaning of the song um it's one of my least favorite songs on the album it's just kind of it's kind of boring yeah track number two, three is the crystal ship Crystal Ship does not sound like a Doors song. It's like a Baroque pop sort of thing, and it's it's confusing. It was released as a B-side to Light My Fire, which was released as um, a single three months after the album was released. There's a lot of speculation what the lyrics are about. I don't think it's about drugs. I don't know. Might be, probably is, but it's also probably just about him breaking up with his girlfriend at the time because like three other songs on this album are also about that. So speaking of William Blake, I was talking about him earlier. Some of the lines in this uh, song are lifted directly from a William Blake poem called uh, The Crystal Cabinet. Also possibly some of the lyrics are lifted from a 12th century Irish poem called The Book of the Dun Cow. I've, I've been researching this. A lot of sources say this, but it doesn't s cite what lyrics it is referring to as the book of the dun cow what it, what is that about if this video is a thousand views i'll do a dramatic retelling of the book of the dun cow in the irish language too next up is 20th century fox this is one of my personal favorites on the album actually and why it's one of my personal favorites on the album is because it sounds so similar to hello i love you which is one of my favorite doors songs this song to me sounds like a precursor to hello i love you in fact there are some parts in the song where it sounds like almost identical i never really paid any attention to 20th century fox until about a week ago when i was listening to the album again but i like it it's it's an underrated, it's an underrated track. Okay, next up is the Alabama song or Whiskey Bar. So from what I'm gathering about this song, it was a German poem slash song from the 1920s. And then it was translated into English in like the late 20s. And then it was used in a play called uh, The Rise and Fall of the City Mahogany. And then the Doors version is a cover of the version from a rise from the rise and fall of the city mahogany which is a loosely based on the english translation of a german poem song that's what i've gathered and the doors version is like a mixture of avant pop and like psychedelia and like carnival music it's like uh, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, which was recorded a month after this album came out. I'm not saying there's any relation there. What I am saying is Alabama song walked so benefit of Mr. Kite could run. And back when I did a quick one, I said I was torn between a quick one, this album, and then Igor by Tyrant the Creator. This, what, Whiskey Bar was one of the um, original reasons I wanted to do it for a Halloween album, because it's a little bit spooky. A little bit spooky and then this is one of the only tracks if not the only track on the album where all the band members have backing vocals and it was played pretty frequently at the whiskey go-go out um, throughout 1966 closing outside one is light my fire this is probably the most famous song off this album and it was released as a single um in april of 1966 I mean, 1967, I believe, so three months after the album was released, and it almost knocked Strawberry Fields' Penny Lane off of, uh, the number two spot, I believe. This, the, them releasing, them releasing Light My Fire as a single, to me, was like their breakout. Light My Fire was originally supposed to have a Latin sort of rhythm, sort of a reggaeton rhythm, and they played it a few times at the Whiskey in early 1966 with a Latin rhythm, sort of. Ray Manzarek used his classic Vox Continental on Light My Fire, which was sort of his like go-to keyboard 
In May of 1967, they were invited to perform the song on the Ed Sullivan Show, so long as they didn't use the line, couldn't get much higher, as they believed it referred to drugs. Which, surprisingly, for a door song, it actually didn't refer to drugs, but were told by the producers not to, and then they did. And it was a whole big thing, and then they were banned from playing the Ed Sullivan Show. Another interesting thing, on the original stereo mixing of the song, it was slightly pitched down, and it was not corrected until the 40th anniversary edition of the album. It was not pitch corrected until 2007. So people in 1967 and people now were listening to a completely different version. Well, not completely different version, just a slightly different version. One was slightly lower than the other. Opening up side two is Backdoor Man. Backdoor Man is a cover of a blues song by uh, Willie Dixon, originally performed by Howlin' Wolf in 1960. But the Doors version of the song is based off of John Hammond Jr.'s version from 1964. It's a lot of people's top pick when they're talking about this album. I don't think so. I think it's a pretty boring song. It, it just does not feel unique to me. I much prefer the original, like, Howlin' Wolf version than the Doors version. Next up is I Looked At You. I really paid no attention to the song before giving this album a thorough listen to for this video, but I really like it actually. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like if Beatles for Sale era Beatles had started taking LSD at that time. <laughs> like if Beatles for Sale era Beatles discovered the electric organ and singing louder. Yeah, I'd say it's an underrated song on this album. The, the, the organ on the song is very good. Next is End of the Night. End of the Night was the B-side to Break On Through when it was released as a single a th few days before the album was released. Some of the lyrics are also lifted from a William Blake, from some William, some William Blake poem. And Robbie Krieger does an excellent slide guitar solo. It's very spooky. It's kind of like a spooky, mysterious song. It's sort of like Riders on the Storm, sort of like a calmer version a less desperate version of Riders on the Storm. I actually have nothing to say about the next track, Take It As It Comes. It's just very boring. It's, it's not It's not a great song. Yeah, I don't, I have no, I have nothing more to say. And finally, is the end. The end is an almost 12 minute epic consisting of so many different genres, like Southern Asian, spoken word, psychedelic rock, it's, a little everything. Really. If you came here looking for me to give you a in-depth lyrical analysis of the end, then you've come to the wrong place because that video would be like two and a half hours long and I'm not gonna do it right now. The end is very cryptic. There's it, a lot of lyrics as it is almost 12 minutes long, but I'm not gonna do a lyrical analysis of it right now. Maybe someday though. Maybe I will just make a video dedicated to breaking down the lyrics of the end. The song was originally written in early 1966 about Morrison breaking up with his then girlfriend, but it sort of morphed into whatever it's about now throughout like four or five months of performing it at the Whiskey. Probably most famously used in Francis Ford Coppola's film Apocalypse Now, where they create a remix of the song. But yeah, like I said earlier, like right at the end of recording the end, Jim Morrison went into an LSD-induced fit and broke a bunch of equipment and chucked a TV across the room and then stormed that at a studio. Which isn't really important. I just think it's kind of funny. But yeah, that is all the tracks on the doors. Now let's get into my thoughts. Okay. <laughs> This is a great album. I think it's sort of like, like I was saying with Revolver a few weeks ago, it's one of those defining um, beginning of the psychedelic period era. While, Re while Revolver was sort of the stepping stones, The Doors was the finished product of that. That would that went on to, def to define what 1967 was. I think this is an important album. I do prefer The Doors' second album, Strange Days, over this. Strange Days feels more polished and less sort of all over the place. Strange Days is a bit like anti-Sergeant Pepper, like like Commander Salt 
someday I will do a video on that album because it is one currently it's one of my favorite albums. What are you doing? But anyway, yeah, that was The Doors. Goodbye, bozos.